Hi, this is Jeffrey Tucker of the Brownstone Institute. And it's my great pleasure to be here with Knut Witkowski. Uh, yeah, and, and Knut, it's wonderful to see you. This is, uh, you're a, a highly credentialed and experienced epidemiologist and expert on uh, uh, virology and immunology, uh, working in universities and, and, and industry for a very long time. And I think what's important about you, <laughs> as you well remember, it's now the two year anniversary of our first discussion <laughs> that we had back right after lockdowns. And the truth of the matter is, based on my memory, is that you were the very first highly credentialed scientific expert to come out publicly and oppose these lockdowns and the entire pandemic uh, uh, policy. Uh, you were the you were the very first voice. Uh, I published that on March the thirty first, twenty twenty. Yeah, and because um, you saw what was happening, I mean, you, I mean, you had been two weeks in. You said this is this is this is crazy. This is dangerous. Uh, can we just march through that history? I mean, the, the very first message we heard from the outset was we had to stop doing everything in order to flatten the curve, and you took issue with that right away. Okay, the, very early on after we had seen what happened in Italy, where the hospital system collapsed initially in the north, I understood that people could be scared, although I wasn't, because I didn't think that the situation in the United States was comparable to what we have in northern Italy, because Italy has the oldest population in the world next to Japan, and potentially the Vatican state who doesn't report the numbers. So having the oldest population and a healthcare system that is always troubling, troubled is a bad situation for a disease like that. And so it wasn't really likely for the same situation to happen in the United States but one could envision it might. And so I could understand when in late March, around March the 20th, 2020, the lockdowns in the United States started for a limited period of three or four weeks to prevent the hospital system from becoming overloaded. But then four weeks later, Robert Redfield, the then director of the CDC, prevented data at the White House in New York on April the 17th, showing that no more people were showing up in than usual, were showing up in emergency rooms. So the epidemic from that perspective of how the hospitals were um, overloaded was over. And at that point, at the latest, one should have reopened schools and the economy because the worst was over. And then continuing with something that is not necessary has known side effects. And now we are suffering from these side effects. You're speaking about New York, and that's where you live. And there were as I recall, two basically two hospitals in two boroughs that were were a little bit overwhelmed at the at the, at the, the outset, right? Um, one was but, in the Queens and one was in Brooklyn, and these were in neighborhoods where people uh, in low income neighborhoods where people don't pay a lot, and so the hospitals are constantly struggling. Right, and what was strange about about that period is that, you know, the idea of flattening the curve, it, it was it was a national idea, right? So so even where the pandemic, where, where SARS-CoV-2 had not even reached people to any significant degree, and I'm speaking about the South and Texas and the West and, and, and so on, uh, everybody had to participate on this sort of national scale in this, in this, in this flattening the curve exercise uh, and yet it was it was a highly localized problem, as you say. Yeah. Um, well, I, as I said, I understand that people were scared 
that starting in April the 17th, we had the data that that scare was not really justified. And you also speculated from the very beginning that the way out of this pandemic, for, well, let me ask you this. Did you foresee uh, the way in which the uh, case infections would be sort of migratory in a geographic sense? Like you knew it was in New York. Did you foresee that it would creep downwards to Texas and then, and then you know, to the South and but then west? The United States is a huge country. Yeah. And all epidemics take time to go from one end to the other end of the country. That is just normal. That is nothing to be foreseen. This is just what happens in a large country. It happened also in China. There's also it was at that time Wuhan was different from other parts of China. And the lock or the isolation of Wuhan. Uh, happen, worked very well at that point in time. When you say it works very well, uh, to to reduce the uh, uh, the rate of infection. No, to limit the sp uh, the spread, uh, to keep it in Wuhan. Mm -hmm. I see. And so now, to so this is something that epidemiologists have always done everywhere. If you have the chance, you see an outbreak and you can encapsulate that region where you have the outbreak, then this is what people do. And if you want to read about that, you can read Camus' flag. Yeah, that's a, a great book. But still, it's terrifying for the population. It may never be worth it. But uh, but it, from an epidemiological point of view, you can see how uh, a, a quarantining of a city might might contain. Um, uh, now, another thing I remember you said at the time was that uh, this this attempt to flatten the curve, you know, could potentially just end up in prolonging the pain that that we had to experience. Well, this is not what could have. This is what happens by definition. If you flatten the curve, you're prolonging the period it takes until we have the only thing that stops a respiratory virus disease, and that is herd immunity. To reach to the point of herd immunity, which again, it's the only thing that stops a respiratory virus disease epidemic. It's not a governor running around with tweezers and collecting all the viruses. That does not work. We have to wait for nature to take its course. So if you flatten the curve, it takes more time. But there is, there is no alternative to that. This is just two sides of the same coin. If you flatten the curve, it takes more time to get to the point of herd immunity, which is the only thing that ends such an epidemic. Which is to say widespread uh, naturally acquired immunity. Yeah. Well, it, it actually doesn't matter whether it's natural acquired or through, with the vaccine, although the respiratory virus diseases, uh, we, it takes a long time to make vaccines. And so in a sense, yes, it's natural immunity. And we had, even early on, it was in April, March or April, I forgot the date, we had regions in New York where 65% of people had antibodies. So they were, now I'm saying something that politicians don't like to hear, they were immune. <coughs> and that was more than enough to stop the further spread of the virus. So we had herd immunity here in New York. I think it was in late March or very early April. I forgot the date. But And yet New York did have uh, two or three more waves of, of, inf uh, uh, of infection following. Not really. That. 
Uh, well, uh, not, not in 2020, or at least not that early on. New York had one big wave, and that ended. And the interesting thing is that the infections ended before the lockdowns even started. So this was just nature doing what nature does, because nature had a couple of tens, hundreds of thousands of years to practice and to find out what is the best strategy to deal with these respiratory virus diseases that are hitting us all the time, every year. And over the last hundred years, we had a few dozen coronavirus epidemics because this is where eventually then uh, the colds, the coronavirus colds emerged. Um, what uh, what happens to the, because the, the coronavirus has had a, have a tendency to mutate, correct? Yes. Uh, all respiratory virus diseases have that. Uh, we have seen that, for instance, um, in 1918, 1919, when there was a virus mutating, which was the only time uh, before this SARS epidemic or COVID, ep sorry, COVID epidemic that uh, the human interventions had a major impact on the spread of a virus, allowing a new virus to emerge that was resistant against immunity from the previous virus. So, if I'm understanding you correctly, you think that <clears throat> the tendency to want to suppress the spread uh, created the conditions uh, that uh, led to a, a, a further mutation of the virus that might not have other, otherwise occurred? Yeah. It happened only twice in the last one, 120 years. One was in 1918, 1919, and then in 2020, 2021, and 2022. Um, and how does this how does this work? How, how does it actually work? That uh, it's very simple. Okay. Viruses mutate all the time, and acquire while they're mutating in an, in a population, they require escape mutations. They become resistant to particular antibodies that humans have developed. Now, humans develop more than one antibody, naturally. Vaccines are only one antibody, typically, but natural immunity has several. So for a virus needs to acquire several mutations and sequentially, it so requires several mutations sequentially to escape the natural immunity. And that takes time because it has to happen in different people and then be selected for because every time the virus becomes a bit less sensitive to the immunity, a bit more resistant until we are at the point where the virus has escaped, where the virus is resistant against the immunity that has been developing in the population, and then it can spread again as if it were a totally new virus, because it is a totally new virus from the perspective of the human immune system. Now, how does a, 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 a letting life go on as normal, not locking down, not flattening the curve, not isolating people, but le letting people uh, g gather in groups and go about life normally, um, how does that affect the uh, uh, trajectory of mutation of a respiratory virus? Then there's not enough time for the virus to acquire sequentially all of those mutations. The virus will acquire a few mutations, but there will not be one strain of virus developing over time that has all of these mutations. There may be different viruses around for different, with different mutations, but there will be no single strain that has all of the mutations needed to escape the human immune system. 
And so a typical epidemic, and we have seen that in Wuhan, we have seen that in South Korea early on, we have seen that in the Northeast in the United States is over in six weeks, let's say, something like that. And that six weeks is not enough time for the virus to become resistant. We then have had studies that showed it takes three months. And these three, so nature has balanced that very nicely. We develop just enough antibody to get rid of a respiratory virus disease epidemic that is naturally spreading. If we are flattening the curve, broad, prolonging the spread, we are getting into a state that nature had not anticipated. And then we are responsible for what's happening. And what's happening then is we get one wave after the other. This must have, what you're saying right now sounds to, this is not your theory. This is a conventional, oh. yeah. This is standard epidemiological knowledge. So it must have startled you at the, at the time to hear everybody saying all this other nonsense when you could see very clearly what was happening and what was going to happen. Yeah, it, actually we knew that something else would happen that would make the whole situation even worse. Um, so I'm going back to the herd immunity thing that now we can talk about and long in 2020, we were not allowed to talk, to use the word herd immunity. We were censored if we were just using that one word. Uh, but now with the advent of virus vaccines, we can actually say that again, which is good. So we have to get to herd immunity. It's the only thing that ends the epidemic. I don't think one can say that often enough because people have all sorts of things that could end the herd in a respiratory virus disease epidemic unless you do something as extreme as in China, and even there it seems to be failing, unless you have the military coming in and isolating people. I could just imagine how that would work in New York. Uh, unless you are having that drastic measures, the only thing that ends a respiratory virus disease epidemic is herd immunity. So we have to get there. And at least initially, people now have all sorts of ideas, but at least initially that meant 60, maybe 70% of people becoming immune. And then somebody who gets infected has a small chance only to find somebody else to infect. And then the epidemic ends. That's a normal end of an epidemic. So, we want to get to herd immunity with the smallest number of deaths we can have. Because if somebody gets infected and get over it with no or mild symptoms, so what? Even if you have to stay at home for two days because your nose is running or your sore throat, that is not the end of the world. That does not justify shutting down the economy with all and depriving children of education with all of the consequences that has. So we have to prevent death from happening while we are getting to herd immunity. Now the people who are dying, and we knew that from the early data in Italy, are the people who have not one, but several comorbidities and are old, as most of these people are. So they're in their 80s, they have several comorbidities, they have cardiovascular diseases, they have type 2 diabetes as a very severe um, <clears throat> condition, they have obesity, they have all of those symptoms of metabolic syndrome. And we knew that from the people who died in Italy early on. So these people who are at high risk of dying, they need to isolate and they should be supported. They should wear a mask. 
as should all people directly interact with them. So the healthcare worker carrying them from the bed into the wheelchair or the other way around, they should wear masks. They should isolate. We should pay Uber or uh, whatever company, taxis, to deliver food, to pick up their clothes, to help them to stay home during that six weeks the epidemic takes to pass. And then we have reduced the number of deaths. Just to give you a number, in 2020, in the United States, 168 people under the age of 18 died of COVID or with COVID. 168 out of something like 500,000. And virtually all of them, and some people say all of them, had type 1 diabetes or other severe diseases that made COVID for them so dangerous. Everybody else in that age group, all other children and youth, and most of the healthy adults survived. So the only thing that was needed was supporting the vulnerable so that they don't die and just wait for the whole epidemic to end naturally. Now, if, you, if everybody else does exactly the same thing, if everybody wears masks, if everybody self-isolates, the restaurants are closing, the bars are closing, the economy is closing, then the vulnerable who are self-isolating or are being isolated in nursing homes, which unfortunately didn't happen in the United States, everybody else, these vulnerable people are at the same risk to be infected by the virus as everybody else, because then the virus, if everybody does the same thing, the virus spreads everywhere at the same rate. And if the virus spreads at the same rate, many more of the vulnerable get infected, even though it takes a bit longer. Many more of the vulnerable get infected, and they are the people who die. So we have many more deaths if we do mitigation. It is not what people believe, because our politicians are telling that. It is not that mitigation reduces the number of deaths. The opposite is true. Universal mitigation increases the number of deaths and dramatically so. How dramatical is something that we have seen in the United States where the, the huge number of people died in nursing homes, because this is where we have the most vulnerable people, those who are not, cannot move around anymore, are not self-sufficient enough. Here in New York, which was first not reported or misreported, here in New York, we had 14,000 people dying of COVID in 2020, 14,000 in New York alone. So of the people who died of the first epidemic, the vast majority were the vulnerable who could have been protected if it had not been for the universal mitigation, which was correctly criticized, although not strongly enough in the Great Barrington Declaration in August, if I remember right. But the, this is what I wrote in end of March. This was nothing new. Um, and after you wrote that article, did you expect that it would be that your your position and your and your uh, your your willingness to speak out would would suddenly turn so to to it, it turned you into such a person of controversy? No. I was just doing what I have done for 35 years, and that is educating people about this 
somewhat complex uh, dynamic of infectious diseases spreading in a population. And then almost immediately, I guess your email was blowing up, your phone was ringing off the hook, everybody was against you. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't go that far, uh, but it was my alma mater distanced itself from me. Hmm. Uh, the Rockefeller University issued a press release criticizing me uh, for doing science. And in several um, channels in the internet, I was censored. Because if you do science, uh, you are interfering with the government. And our media now are supporting the government against science. Why? I don't understand. Yep. Uh, another thing which I don't understand, and maybe you don't understand, is why, is if what you're saying is, is textbook uh, virology. And... Yep. No, no, no it, epidemiology. That's the epidemiology. big mistake people make, that they think virologists uh -huh. are the right people to advise on epidemiological issues. I see. A virologist, no, I'm simplifying, so I apologize to every virologist. Uh, a virologist studies the structure of a virus and how the virus binds to a cell and how one could come up with the vaccine to prevent that from happening. These are all technical aspects that are totally independent of the question of how fast does the virus spread and among which populations and which interventions are the most effective against the spread of the virus. But here in the United States, we had the three so-called experts. We are all three HIV in virologists, and in particular, vaccinologists. There was not a single, there was also a brain surgeon, uh, but there was not a single epidemiologist in the team of people who were thinking about what the right policy in the United States should be. That changed only very, very late. But some of them, so one person who understood much better was Scott Atlas, but Scott Atlas came on board only, was it in August? August. Yeah, so very late in the game and much of the damage had already been done. Hmm. Uh, there was, it seemed to be that once the lockdowns happened, why do you suppose there are so few scientists like you who are speaking out? Were, were people afraid or are they, they're not used to dealing with the media? Um, they really one, one, thing is, one thing is, there are not that many theoretical infectious disease epidemiologists in the United States. Hmm. There are a few. John Ioannidis is one that who comes to mind, Stanford. Most people who consider or are now calling themselves epiderm, what was the name? Didn't know how to spell the word in 2020, but now they're experts. Um, it takes a long time to understand the complex dynamics of epiderm epidemics in complex populations. And so many people who had maybe the word public health or epidemiology in their title or somewhere, were not really were dealing with aspects that are not directly related to the questions that we had here. And then there is a problem that has 
evolved over the last 50 years or so, and I have seen that. 50 years ago, maybe 60, if you became a professor at a university, you had a salary, and you had a couple of people funded by the university to work with you. That situation is long gone. Today, you get some, you get a salary for a year or two, and then you have to write, during that time, you have to write your grants to fund your own salary and the money you need for people working with you. The university gives you a desk and access to the library. Okay, I'm simplifying it. So if you are a scientist in public health, you have to get grants. And most of these grants come from the NIH. So it would be not wise to issue it, to say anything that is not aligned with the current policy by the NIH. By NIH representatives, because if you disagree, there may be one person in the study section who also doesn't like what you said. And if one person in the study section among 20 people says no, given the competitiveness of grants today, the decision is no. So you lost your income and you lost the funds to pay the people working with you. Very few people will run the risk. So very few people will say something that contradicts or criticizes what the current policy of the government is. That's how the independence of science has turned into something entirely different. That's remarkable. And um, I don't know how you reform that or fix that because these budgets are, are huge. Um, yeah, then you have other conflicts of interest, right? So then you have uh, the pharmaceutical companies working so tightly with the FDA um, but maybe we don't want to get into that. But that's it. That's a, it, it, maybe. I don't think that this really makes that much of a difference. You don't? Uh, the pharmaceutical industry, they compete with each other. And they can do that in any environment. So if the government says A, they compete about A. If the government says B, they compete about B. Uh -huh. uh, they are relatively independent of the government, except when the government says, okay, we have, we are spending a few billion dollars here for something. Uh, do you want that? And then the companies would say, okay, we split that, we take it. Uh, but I don't see pharmaceutical companies as a driving force behind this here. Uh, yeah, and that, that's been a question I've had too, because there have been some talk about the possibility of developing a vaccine. Uh, early on, I remember getting a call sometime in late March, early April from, from a guy who used to be with the Gates Foundation, um, uh, who, who now runs a vaccine company. And he said the purpose was to lock down until we could get a vaccine. Um, which okay, that was not from the beginning. In March 2020, the lockdowns were predicted to last only three or four weeks until the initial spike flattened a bit to prevent hospitals, the hospital system from collapsing. And we had one politician, and I don't want to make a political statement. There are many things I disagree with, what that politician said. But he said, let's reopen for Easter. And 
that was actually, it should have happened. The epidemic would have taken a much different course. Many, only for maybe 10% people who actually died so far, it would have died if the lockdowns had ended by Easter. That's a remarkable statement. Um, uh, but, but Scott Atlas reports that by the time he got there, uh, the bureaucrats were really running everything, not, not really the White House. Uh, I'm a scientist. I, I don't want to go too big, <laughs> too deep in um, politics. And that's why I said, I'm not making a political statement here about whatever else that position politicians did or said, but the, the idea of reopening for Easter was right. Yeah. How long do you suppose, well, let me ask you this. Do you sense that there are many people who are looking back with a profound sense of regret at what happened? Uh, in other words, yes, all politicians. Oh, really? And what about epidemiologists and scientists? Uh, as I said, they do whatever the politicians say. Most of them. I see. I see. Uh, so you you sense that there's a real sadness out there because I, I see it both directions. I mean, many more people now seem to look back and say we made uh, huge errors, but at the same time, there's a, there's still a lot of people out there who are defending uh, these uh, mitigation strategies and lockdowns and so on. I'm still walking down the street here in New York. And I would say about half of the people were wearing a mask outside at a time where it's not, re not required anymore. The fear that was created persists. And so we still have mitigation. Restaurants in New York used to be open till one o'clock, two o'clock on a regular basis. Now, if you want to have a glass of wine after the opera, you're out of luck. It may start eventually again, but most places, that used to be open and allow people to communicate are closed because people stay at home. They're scared. And as long as they people don't get into contact anymore, we still have some form of mitigation. And that means we're still depriving the vulnerable of having an advantage, and we're still flattening the curve. Not as drastic anymore, but still. And so we should expect, for instance, more waves. Every wave we have comes from a virus that evolved to be resistant. So we have now, the, if we simplify this, the second Omicron, we just said, no, we have the second Omicron wave. So now we have BA2 that has already been hitting the UK, where the number of deaths is increasing. Uh, three or four weeks ago, I think that, that started. So we can expect that to happen in the United States as well. Yeah. Uh, and you... then there is something that let me, uh, something that I am afraid of. I'm not so much afraid of the next uh, version of Omicron. We had Delta for six months. I would expect that's what biology would tell you. I would expect 
that during that time, somewhere, a resistant version of Delta emerged and is already spreading slowly somewhere, not necessarily in the US, but maybe. And there's something people forget. The initial spread of respiratory virus vaccine is very, very slow. So right now we have BA2 taking over the United States. That means most infections right now are BA2. If there are a few post delta infections among them, they are likely to be overlooked. Mm -hmm. But eventually, BA2, the number of BA2 infections will go down because of natural immunity. And then we will see, oops, we have something else coming in. And I would expect that to be a new version of Delta. But of course, this is a bit speculated. But that is the danger that we are running into. That all that mitigation, now that was the mitigation we had earlier this year while Delta was spreading. And well, last year. Now it's a bit less, but it's still, we have not fully reopened. In New York, right now, schools start masking children again. Which is the mo one of the most counter effective things you can even think about. It is now common knowledge that children, young people, and in particular children, do not die or have any severe effects unless they have known risk factors like type 1 diabetes. Children with type 1 diabetes, of course, should be protected like all other vulnerable populations. But other than that, children are doing fine. And we have to get to whatever the herd immunity is. I don't want to get into these numbers where everybody comes up with a new number and a new justification for these numbers. And often these numbers are politically justified that we have a politician saying, well, Last month, I couldn't say this number. No, uh, it's political opportune. So I say the number. I, that's a science now. And um, we see the lockdowns or the, the mitigation coming back. And that means we are flattening the curve, giving the virus more time. If the virus has more time, there's a higher, better chance for the virus to develop resistance. And then we have a new strain that will come again. It will only stop if we let nature do what nature has done successfully over hundreds of years. And in particular, because culture was different before, over the last 100 years against all the coronavirus uh, variants that we had during that period of the time where we couldn't sequence yet, and therefore we never knew whether uh, a particular flu is now influenza or coronavirus or maybe something else. If we don't, and essentially worldwide, if we don't stop what politicians have this huge experiment that politicians started to fight the respiratory virus disease epidemic with lockdowns, something that was never, had never done before and was never shown to be effective, that was always known to have severe side effects. If that doesn't become common knowledge among politicians, this can last for a long, long time, this 
sequence of epidemics. Now people say, ah, we are we are so lucky, we are getting, entering an endemic state. Endemic means there is a virus around. And when it gets colder or some other parameters in the environment change, then that virus has always is always there, begins to spread more. And if the conditions change again, it spreads less. That's what happens with flus, with colds. And then there are things that happen in waves that are shorter and much more pronounced. And if we have these waves, you have epidemics, especially when we know that they're different. We can characterize each wave by the variant of the virus that is spreading during that wave. And if we have different waves caused by different viruses within a relatively short period of time, a year, then we know we are still in a situation where we have deal with epidemics and not with endemics. So I may you create that word. No, that's fine. That's good. Well, this is a, a terrifying warning, and uh, I'm so grateful for the time that you've spent uh, I hope that this video is shared widely so that uh, politicians and and uh, can can learn about the subject about which they apparently they knew nothing going into this, and so that scientists too can uh, be emboldened to to speak out uh, against these uh, very dangerous policies that you 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 saw so early on and spoke very forcefully about it. Uh, at a time when uh, nobody was making sense. So, and I would like to make one comment, mm -hmm. and that is I'm trying to stay away as much as I can from conspiracy theories. Yes. Uh, we don't need conspiracy theories here. We just need to understand epidemiology 101. Mm -hmm or infectious disease epidemiology 101. Yeah. There is nothing unusual happening from the perspective of the epidemic. The epidemic takes all the opportunities politicians create for it. Yeah. yeah. And what the politicians need to understand is something that my namesake said in the 11th century. So it's or showed. So his name was Knut, King Knut of Denmark, England, and Norway. The most powerful person at that time in Europe, maybe the world. And he got annoyed by people expecting him to do solve all problems all the time immediately. And to show that he, he can't. He walked to the shore and told the tide to stay away. The tide didn't. The time came, tide came. A virus disease, a respiratory virus disease epidemic is like tide. It's coming. And we can direct it a bit, like we can have a dam to direct shield part of the country and direct the water somewhere else. That we can do. Can we stop the tide? No. And the same applies to virus diseases. Yes, we can protect the vulnerable people and help them not to get infected so that they don't die. But we cannot stem the epidemic. This is as impossible as it is to stem the tide. And that is something our politicians need to understand, that something a politician a thousand years ago understood is still true.
Thank you very much, Newt. And um, I hope to see you again in New York at some point. Um, thank you again for spending My pleasure. an hour with me today. Looking forward. All the best. Thank you.